Good morning, everyone. We hope your morning has gone well, and we trust that this study of God's Word will make the rest of the day go even better. Uh, we want to study from the Beatitudes today, and you will find them in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Let me read verses 3 through 10. Matthew 5, verses 3 through 10. And then we will note the particular beatitude that we're going to uh, going to deal with. Jesus, of course, is speaking as the inspired apostle Matthew records. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And of course, for a couple of verses after that, he elaborates upon being persecuted for righteousness. But here's some general remarks in understanding the Beatitudes that we want to notice before we get to the particular one we'll study today. As I said earlier, these Beatitudes uh, begin what we know as our Lord's famous Sermon on the Mount. And you notice that the sermon deals, the whole sermon deals with one's character, proper, correct character traits. Specifically, those character traits that will characterize citizens of the kingdom of God. Well, of course, that means that if you desire to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, or you're already a citizen of the kingdom, then we should study diligently and understand the contents of this sermon. Now some comments more particularly about the Beatitudes. I like to think of them as beautiful attitudes, beautiful mindsets. And you'll notice that each Beatitude has a particular form. And notice this, in each one of them, there is a declaration of a blessing. There is then a description of the state of mind or attitude. And then there is the record of the disposition of the blessing. So there's a declaration of the blessing, a description of the attitude or mindset, and then there's a disposition of blessing. Now, notice that each one, as I said, begins with this declaration of blessing. The word blessing comes from the Greek word the Holy Spirit had Matthew use, and it's um, the word makarios, and it carries with it the idea of contentment, peacefulness, blessedness. Here is when a state of mind exists that as far as God is concerned, and that's what we're interested in here, God's viewpoint of the matter, that these are beautiful attitudes. And every citizen of the kingdom of heaven will develop these attitudes. You notice then the description of the attitude once it's declared, and then you notice the disposition of the blessing. And what does it mean? Well, it means the actual blessing itself and the very reason for it. So we know then the result from possessing this state of mind, this mindset, this attitude, this beautiful attitude described. Now, those are some general observations of Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. And I've chosen today simply to Look at the one that is, blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that mourn. 
that within itself is a very interesting study, I think, because we need to know the relationship between mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, and being comforted as the scriptures, God's word enlightens us. Thereby, we should be helped to understand the benefits. And that's what Jesus wants us to know of mourning and the very nature of God's comfort for those that mourn because the Lord pronounced a blessing on them. So let's look at some characteristics of mourning. In other words, what does it mean to mourn? Well, of course, we'll examine this first of all, just in the general meaning. If you look at any good dictionary, you'll see that the word mourn is defined to feel or express grief or sorrow. To feel or express grief or sorrow. Of course, that doesn't get into how deep the grief or sorrow may be or how light it may be. It just simply describes what it is. Grief or sorrow, then, is felt or undergone in the mind in varying degrees. And a lot of that depends upon what it is or who it is that you're mourning. So who does the mourning? Well, of course, there's people, people who God wants to be in heaven with him, people to whom God's revealed his mind concerning how to live on this earth. And it is that Jesus has left us, so Peter writes, an example or a pattern that we should follow in his steps. In fact, that is said directly in the context of suffering persecution, but it would cover all things pertaining to Christ. Well, I can't know anything about that if I don't know the words of his last will and testament and specifically these matters. So what do these mourn, these people that are engaged in mourning? Well, these are blessed because they are mournful. And the scriptures most often use the word in relationship to the death of a loved one. Abraham mourned Sarah, Genesis 23, 2. Jacob mourned Joseph. Genesis 37, verse 34. And David mourned Absalom, 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. Also, you remember that Samuel mourned for King Saul's sin, 1 Samuel 15, and verse 35. Ezra chapter 10, and verse 6 says that Ezra mourned for the transgressions of Israel. And Nehemiah chapter 1 in verse 4, the record declares that he mourned the destruction and the desolation of Jerusalem. Well, this raises this question for us to make this a practical application to those of us today who would be citizens of the kingdom or who are trying to develop these characteristics as citizens of the kingdom. Who do we mourn today? Or better yet, let's ask what? What do we mourn today? Well, the death of family members. We mourn the death of friends. We also mourn those who are involved in sin and will not repent. We see all kinds of calamities that come upon people around the world, even as we're experiencing at this time. We also mourn the ignorance of people. As God said through the prophet Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's all ignorance means, a lack of knowledge. Well, how can you serve God if you don't know anything about how God wants to be served? So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us that's the reason that God has given us his word. We might raise this question at this point. Why do these mourn? That is those that Jesus pronounced the blessing on. We can say that they mourn because of injustice. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse two, 
The scripture reads, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear the rule, the people mourn. Of course, that is based on the context of the people loving and caring for and seeking righteousness and lamenting over the fact that their leaders don't. You do have a mess when the people don't want righteousness and they're happy to have the leaders ruling unrighteously. Also, people mourn because sin is in control or dominating one's life. And that person will not accept correction. In Matthew 23 and verse 37, Jesus looked out over Jerusalem, it representing the whole of Israel down through its state of existence. And he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. We're free moral agents. We can learn to love the truth. We can be rational. We can accept the truth because we have that power to choose to do good or do evil. These chose not to. The Lord had worked with Israel for 1,500 years through the law of Moses, which Paul says was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 24. Yet it did no good. And Jesus in his earthly ministry makes it clear they chose not to do God's will. Why do people mourn? Well, because right things have been neglected so long. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 9, the scripture records, and Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law of course israel approached god correctly through the law that was given to them for that purpose deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 1 through 5 it had been neglected a long time and the people were sad when they heard the word of god read to them what about personal sin People mourn over personal sin. Going to the New Testament, James addressed Christians. Remember, I don't know how many times I've said it, but it won't hurt to say it again. Most of the New Testament were written to those who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, trying to keep them faithful, rebuking them for their sins, exhorting them to do what God authorized them to do, and reproving them, showing where they were wrong, and that's the way the word of God is understood as you study it and the way it's to be preached. James 4, 8 through 10 says to all of us, since it was written as a part of the New Testament of Christ, draw nigh or near to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Then he tells us we have a responsibility. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Let me pause here and refer you to a good example of what God means when he says people mourn. Our Lord gave this account of the Pharisee and the publican who went up to the temple to pray. Luke chapter 18, notice what he says. Verse 10 beginning, Luke 18 verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee 
But I am not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Then Jesus focuses in, in verse 13 of the publican, and the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's as good an example as I can give toward how God wants man to see himself since all have sinned to come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. God has, as a um, prosecuting attorney, indicted us saying that we have sinned. Now, the Pharisee wasn't going to say that he was that way. But look who went up to his house or down to his house justified. It was the man who the Pharisee looked down on. And thank God he wasn't like. But he failed to realize this man had the right mindset, the beautiful attitude. And he was blessed because he recognized the indictment was true. And he smote his breast and bowed and would not look up to heaven. He was mourning his sins and his need of mercy from God if heaven was to be his home. And that's as good of an example as blessed are they that mourn because it all doesn't have to do with loss physically of a loved one or a friend or some valuable piece of property. It also has to do with how you view yourself. And we all want to do that the way God views us. And Jesus just gave us how God viewed two men. And we need to learn to have that kind of contrite heart that when we've done all we know the New Testament says we ought to do, all we've done is our duty. We need, therefore, the mercy and grace of God. A citizen of the kingdom of heaven has an attitude, and he develops it continually. Now, what blessings are associated with Morning. First of all, we'll say sobriety. Sobriety. Facing reality, seeing it for what it actually is. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, in verse 2, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. In other words, face the reality of it. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9.27. It's better to realize the design and purpose of life in the flesh, how brief and uncertain it is, and that our duty here is to fear God and keep his commandments. So that's the whole duty of man. Remember, James said, as he wrote to Christians, that our life is like a vapor. It appeared for a little while and then vanish the way. Well, as we look at sobriety as one of the fruits of mourning correctly and how that that blesses us, we also see it gives us wisdom. Knowledge alone is the beginning of wisdom, but wisdom is how to use what you know. It comes from experience. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. While the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Ecclesiastes 7 in verse 4. A long, long time ago, and you don't know sometimes when you're a young person how much certain choices mean to you as life goes on, but I learned as a teenager to listen to people who were much older than me and had been where I had not been who had proven their knowledge of the Bible, but had it exercised, and wisdom came from them. I couldn't very well listen to people my age. They had no more experience than I did. And some of them, of course, didn't care one way or the other about what the Bible said. That's why the Bible lets the old person represent wisdom. So many young people like Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, turns his ear away from the older wise men, listen to people his own age. 
And we see where that went. Well, there's sobriety that can come from mourning. There is wisdom that can come from mourning, but also humility. Remember the prayer of the publican and what he said about himself? In James 4, 9 through 10, James 4, 9 through 10, James addressed these Christians by saying, be afflicted and mourn and weep. And let, yet, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Now, what's the result of that? And he shall lift you up. What was the end result of the attitude of the publican who wouldn't even look to heaven but smote his breast as he stood afar off and said, Be merciful to me, a sinner? Jesus said he went down to his house justified. Now, who is it that doesn't want to be justified in the eyes of the Lord? Well, we're seeing some of these blessings of mourning, what it means to mourn, and mourning for the right thing. I don't know of anyone who has become a Christian as a that process. And as the Bible defines and uses the word Christian, a member of the church, that did not come to a state of mourning and face the reality of his life, lost in sin, and accept the plan of salvation and what it meant for the rest of his life, that developed wisdom thereby and humility in obedience to the gospel. And the one that remains faithful will cultivate that sobriety, that wisdom, and that humility. For a moment, let's look at the characteristics of comfort. What is comfort? What is comfort? Well, again, we go to the dictionary or any good English dictionary, and it defines it something like this to soothe in time of affliction or distress. Now, there's different ways you can do that according to maybe even the age of the person or the situation the person's in that's causing him or her to mourn. Nevertheless, that's your goal when you comfort somebody is to soothe them and their affliction or their distress. You'll remember that the three so-called friends of Job came to do that, but they didn't do much comforting. They had it all messed up themselves as to what ought to be. We may comfort others, or one may even comfort himself. When the Ethiopian eunuch heard the gospel and rose from the watery grave of baptism, having obeyed the gospel, the Bible says he went on his way rejoicing. He knew he was saved from his sins, reconciled to God. He knew he was walking in the way of truth, and he was happy about it. So it is that we can comfort ourselves by being honest with ourselves as we study the Bible and apply it to our lives, making whatever adjustments there need be in our lives to fit the truth we've learned. We may comfort others, or we may comfort ourselves. And if we've lived the Christian life, We've done both. Who is it that gives comfort? And how are we comforted? Well, let's just say this. Ultimately and finally, God is the source of all comfort. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in his second epistle, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 2 Corinthians 1. Three and four. It's good sometimes to have a faithful brother or sister remind us in our times of trials and tribulations or sickness or illness, or whatever. Remember, you're a child of the king. Remember what God's promised you. Remember, God will not forsake you. 
Remember that even in death, he will be with you. That, of course, should motivate a person who knows they're in sin and won't repent to repent. But for the one who loves the truth and lives it, it is great encouragement. Paul also said to the Thessalonian brethren in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given unto us everlasting consolation and good hope, through grace, listen, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You'll notice that that involves our being active in putting into practice what Jesus said Christians ought to be doing. There's how you have peace of mind and the Lord will strengthen you that as you reflect on your own life in the light of the rightly divided word, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, you'll be comforted to know what's right because you're doing it and you can know it. That's one of the things that's said by James in James chapter 1. Remember, he writes to Christians, not those outside of Christ. And he said, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. What? Here's our word again. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Now remember what we said about blessing. Our fellow Christians who love the Lord and keep his commandments are a great source of comfort to us. Paul also said to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, and verse 11, wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify. That means spiritually build yourself up, edify one another. And then he lets us, us know this about them, even as also you do. In other words, don't stop what I know you're already doing with one another. Again, we notice chapter 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. That's how you keep yourself straight, as well as be what God expects you to be toward all others. Of course, God's good word gives us comfort. When Paul, as the Spirit guided him, wrote, Romans 15, 4, he said the Old Testament Scriptures gives the Christian comfort. For whatsoever things were written, he says comfort of the Scriptures. Whatsoever things are written for our learning, then they comfort us. They let us see that faith, whether it's the patriarchal age, the mosaical age, or the Christian age, has always come by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. That faith is always saved when it was an obedient faith, read Hebrews chapter 11. And today, faith doesn't by itself alone save anybody. But Hebrews 5, 9 says that it's an obedient faith that saves us. This is a point that cannot be overlooked. Now, this ought to be emphasized. Being comforted does not, I say it does not mean that we will not have problems or difficulties. The comfort that God offer, offers and the one to whom Christ blessed comes from knowledge. The knowledge of the truth. Think about that for a minute. Another very common scripture that we use most often. If you continue, Jesus said, in my word, You'll be my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Not only free from sin being forgiven, but free from the anxiety and the affairs of this present world that dominate most people. Now, what is comforting? 
forgiveness for one thing. To be able to pillow your head at night and offer a prayer to God, knowing God forgives you and he hears you. And if you should depart this world in your sleep, you're going straight to glory. Hebrews 10, verse 17, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That means he doesn't hold us against us because of our obedience to the gospel and faithful service as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. The faithful did actually live. Death or dead or die simply means separation. So you're dead physically when your spirit departs your body. But as far as the inward man, you see that you're still that same person. You're just not living in a material world and fleshly body. You're in another state of affairs living, but you're the same person. If you look with me, you will see that he said to the Thessalonians regarding the death of their own brethren, that they are not to be like other folks who have no hope. Listen to him in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning the, them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent, which means in the King James Version, precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, how did the Holy Spirit have him handle that and apply it when he originally wrote this? He said, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. God is merciful. He's long-suffering. He gives us ample and then some opportunity to repent. That's the very point Peter's making in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. It's some men count slackness. That is concerning his second coming. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's also good to know for the faithful child of God that God will be just to those who are lost. In Revelation 15 and verse 3, the scripture reads, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Those that mourn will be comforted because the cause of their mourning will be ultimately, finally, and forever removed. We're in a state of probation now. That's the design and purpose of life in this world and the flesh. To demonstrate to God that we will believe him, that we will obey him, that nothing will stop us from faithful service to him. That our love for him will grow, and that we'll bear up under the burdens of life, keeping his commandments. Now, there are some practical applications that we draw to a close. To the person who denies the existence of God, mourning is a natural part of his life as it is ours. But we have, to use the words of Jesus, meat that they know not of. Matthew 5 and verse 4 again talks about the blessing of those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We should not look at mourning as the world does as something to be necessarily avoided. Because mourning helps us to face reality, not run from it, not make something out of it that it's not. So it's better to mourn than to laugh when it comes to 
what mourning accomplishes if we let it. Ecclesiastes 7, 4. Sobriety, wisdom, and humility. Aren't they virtues? They are, and they are associated with proper mourning. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Comfort helps us to endure our mourning, not avoid it. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 5 and 6. God is the source of all comfort because ultimately he has all the solutions to the reasons for mourning. That ties back in with our Lord's own comment in Matthew 5, 4. Revelation 21 and verse 4 reads, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Again, Revelation 21, 4. That's why Paul says we are saved by hope. But we can look beyond this life, this time of trying, this time of testing, and we can see the day through the eye of faith of eternal redemption and the glory Christ has for us there. So the characteristics of mourning are so important. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The characteristics of comfort, and then we've noticed some practical applications of them. Now, what we've seen about this is something that will be needful all your life. It will characterize you as a faithful citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And for those who would be comforted, as Christ speaks of, you must obey the gospel of Christ. There's no other way. People can sneer at the plan of salvation. They can make light of it. They can reject it. They can persecute you for it. But it won't change the truth of it. To become a Christian, you must believe with all of your heart based on what the Word of God says, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, Romans 10, 17. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17, verse 30. Confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10, and to complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. That's why Peter said, Baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3, 21. Yeah, but Franklin Graham said this, and this preacher said that. You know, they're going to stand in line at the judgment, giving account of their deeds done to the bodies like everybody else. You better go to the Word of God and let it form your faith in God and Christ and what it is to be a Christian and how one becomes a Christian. It may be that as a child of God, you realize you've been mourning the wrong things. You haven't been faithful as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. There's some areas of your life you're reserved to suit yourself. Well, that won't work. You need to repent of those sins. Come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. If in any way we can help you, just let us know. We'll be glad to do so. We'll help you come to a better understanding of the Bible by studying the Bible with you. So we wish you the best. Hope this message has helped. And blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted.